past 100 years, the only way for scientists to uncover the secrets of dinosaurs was by studying bone fragments and ancient fossils. Well, times have changed. Here, at this remote address, new technology is taking the field of paleontology to the edge. As the laboratory staff begins to unload the most dangerous creature to ever walk the planet, get ready for a research facility where imaginations come to life. This 21st century lab is taking science to a new level. For the very first time, it has brought creatures back from extinction and assembled them into a priceless collection of living, breathing dinosaurs. You have now entered an astonishing new world of scientific research. Welcome to DinoLab. Here at DinoLab, real dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures can be tested with powerful machines and brand new technology to discover how smart they are, how much they eat, and how fast they can move. Finally here. Yes, sir. <laughs> Won't go. like, don't worry. What about this one? Oh, he doesn't eat meat. <laughs> here you go. Uh, unfortunately, you can't stay here. Can you follow me, please? Dino Lab has spent months preparing this test for our newest dinosaur, fondly known as the Roadrunner from Hell, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Coaxed by a trail of fresh meat, T Rex has made his way from the back of the truck into a secure tunnel, which will take him into a giant test pit. Roger? Yes, sir. Uh, did you make the last uh, adjustments on the treadmill? Yes, we're good to go. The technicians okay. at Dino Lab have built the world's biggest treadmill to find out once and for all how fast T Rex can run. The crew triple checks that all of the sensors and monitors are working. This is the day all of the Dino Lab technicians have been waiting for running a test on the most fearsome dinosaur of them all. Okay, guys, everybody ready? Let him in. Open the gate. The gate is open. This T-Rex is a large adult, standing almost 20 feet tall. It has a massive jaw, powerful leg muscles, and huge flesh-ripping teeth. It is commonly believed that T-Rex was the ultimate predator, but that would depend largely on how fast he ran. And this is the test Dino Lab is conducting today. To provide expert support for this experiment, we have called in three giants in the field of paleontology. Dr. Ryosuke Motani, Professor Ken Stevens, and Dr. Hans Larsen. I think that, that Tyrannosaurus rex is, is the most fascinating dinosaur and the most popular dinosaur of all time and will be for a long time to come because it's the largest carnivorous dinosaur that we have. There are two or three contenders, but it's certainly the, one of the largest. It's the, one of the oldest known dinosaurs as well. Um, it was named in 1905, so now more than 100 years old, plus children's imaginations makes T-Rex the most popular dinosaur. Knowing the top speed of T-Rex is important because if it ran at only 10 to 15 miles per hour, about as fast as an elephant, there's no way it could have been the deadly hunter we imagine. So, to find out how fast T-Rex could run, we first need to know how much it weighed. So here we have a femur, a, an upper leg bone of a T-Rex. Left side, right. From the left side, right. And the, uh, the femur is nice because it gives us an idea as to what kinds of forces were going on in this animal because it only walked on two legs. Mm -hmm. So at one point, one foot is off the ground and the entire weight of the animal is sitting on this bone. Yes. Which is really a fantastic piece of information because now we can look at bone circumference, like, like the, the whole diameter around here, which I can't even touch 
my fingers around mm -hmm. to give you an idea how big this thing is. In fact, uh, it's more than its weight. It, when it strikes the ground, there's even more force than its mass coming right. back on up. So, so every step this guy is taking, he's not only putting down all his weight on one leg, but the downward momentum of his weight on his leg. So there's really a lot of forces going on here. And we can get an idea for some of the forces just by looking at some of these muscle scars here. So here's a, here's a really rugose region where a really big muscle was inserting onto this right. bone. So Coming it, up over the knee. Yeah, so, so in the size of this insertion and the kind of remodeling that the bone is doing around the muscle gives us an indication that there's lots of forces going on here. Yes. Judging by the thickness of the bones and the huge size of the skeleton, T-Rex should have weighed at least six or seven tons. If that's the case, this heavyweight could not have been the speedy predator we've seen in so many movies. Instead of being the king of the prehistoric jungle, like the modern lion, it would have been a scavenger of dead carcasses, like a hyena. Dino Lab is going to examine this dinosaur in an entirely new way to find out once and for all how fast T-Rex could run. Was it the fleet-footed predator of our imagination, or just a big, dumb scavenger of leftovers? Using a specially designed king-size treadmill, John and his team will clinically measure if the Roadrunner from Hell deserves its nickname. Really slow it, really slow. So how fast was this guy, do you think? Well, that's the tricky question, um, because a lot of the estimates of, let's say, mass or speed are really based on the same kinds of values, like the circumference of the femur, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a circular argument if we start, start trying, to, trying to talk about the two together. So we have to find a way to tease them apart, and which has been the topic of research for many decades. The biggest land animals today the elephants weigh up to five tons and also have huge leg muscles, but they can only reach speeds of 10 to 15 miles per hour. Okay, yeah, faster. Some of the important reasons for, for wanting to know how fast, let's say, a Tyrannosaurus rex could run um, have implications far beyond just physiology. Um, if we think of of some modern reptiles today. They can really go at high speeds, but only for a very short, sustained period of time. If things like a Tyrannosaurus rex could run at high speed and at, at, at sustained rates, uh, this, this gives us a window into how much food these kinds of animals would require. Um, the, the difference is an order of magnitude. If it were cold-blooded with, with capabilities of doing short, fast speeds, it would, let's say, eat X number of pounds of meat per day. If it were highly endothermic, so warm-blooded, and doing the same thing, it would be 10x the amount of meat per day, which is, um, if, we, if we do the math up now, from how many pounds of meat <laughs> a T-Rex would have to eat, if it were cold-blooded versus warm-blooded, is we're approaching uh, eating an elephant a day. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If T-Rex needed to eat several tons of fresh meat every day, speed and endurance would have meant the difference between life or death. 15. Four to five tons per day is a lot of meat. So the question we need to answer is, how could such a huge and heavy predator be so successful at running down its prey? It turns out that the T-Rex may have had a hidden advantage, one that paleontologists only recently discovered. By taking a much closer look at the T-Rex skeleton, scientists found that its bones are not solid, but riddled with holes. This type of bone structure is common in birds, which need to be light to fly, but totally surprising in a gigantic predator that needs to be strong to fight. And it makes a huge difference to how experts calculate the weight of T-Rex. They used to grossly overestimate T-Rex, uh, taking into consideration the fact that there was a lot of pneumaticity, a lot of hollow bones in the anterior skeleton, maybe not in the tail. Uh, do you think those are still overestimates? Um, a lot of the estimates that we do for things like T-Rex 
um, are based on, on solid bones. Um, certainly you're right in taking out some of that mass by, by saying that there's air inside them. Right. I think that we could even go further and maybe take off 40% approximately in terms of total mass, um, not because of just air filling in many of the bones of the body, but also air fills in a lot of the body cavity. So then if we drop down into the three ton range or so for a fully adult T-Rex, what do you think the speed would have been? If we were to drop the mass down yes. to something more realistic, um, realistic along the theropod to bird evolution side, mm -hmm. that we can probably with confidence say that they could run upwards of 25 miles per hour, no problem, right. and maybe even more. Some of the things that, that, that we have to take into account that have yet to be taken into account in terms of, of how fast a, a T-Rex could run are beyond computer models right now. Things like shock absorption, how much uh, energy is stored with inside tendons or springs inside the body. Uh, if we look at the tails of a T-Rex, they're very long. Um, half the length of the T-Rex is in the tail. The tail is also very stiff, with lots of muscles and tendons sheathing the outside of the tail, making it essentially a balancing organ. Now, if you put this thing on a treadmill and we, we watch how it runs, I would bet um, a lot of money that, that um, the tail is actually acting not only as a balancing organ, but as, a, as some kind of a force um, spring um, storage. Very few other dinosaurs could have outrun T-Rex at this speed. New discoveries show that the combination of a lighter body, along with a rigid tail that stores energy with every stride and then releases that energy like a spring, enabled T-Rex to run much faster than we previously thought. If T-Rex could run fast enough to catch any other dinosaur that had the misfortune to cross his path, what defensive mechanisms and survival strategies did other dinos use to protect themselves from those flesh-ripping teeth? John and his team have been cleaning up the mess that our new T-Rex made when it chewed up the power box, and they've made an interesting discovery. If we look at the teeth here, um, this is something that, that this particular specimen shows quite nicely. This is one big scoop and the, the teeth in the back um, are not sharp. They, they do have small serrations, but in life, if you were to run your fingers down the teeth, and if this animal could keep its mouth open long enough, you would be quite safe to, to, to rub your hand along it, so it, it wouldn't be cutting into your, into your fingers. Yes. These are essentially railroad spikes, completely bone crushing, no other, no, other mech, no other function, I think, for these. But when you look at the front teeth, and these are, these are not quite, quite as extreme as what they normally are, but they're very D-shaped or cup-shaped. Mm -hmm. And so this forms almost like a big ice, uh, 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 a one-gallon ice cream scoop. <laughs> and so as these things are, are biting into something, <laughs> God forbid, that, that this ice cream scoop arrangement of teeth is just literally scooping out meat and skin and, and organs, whereas the rest of the jaw is there for absolute crushing. It's also an interesting thing to note that if the head is tilted down, so if the animal points its head down by about 10 degrees, then it maximizes how much of the horizon is seen binocularly. Mm. Uh, this can also be independently noted by looking at the semicircular canals in the vestibular system that would hold the head in a neutral, balanced position. 
So all of the specialization, the narrow snout, the large eyes, the, the frontal vision is far more than what, what would be needed for scavenging. Uh, and it's also much more than what would be needed by a crocodile to simply judge the distance to prey. So it looks mm. like it was giving a panoramic vision, perhaps by scanning around, without giving itself away by large body movements. It could decide the lay of the land and where the prey were in front of the animal. It is clear that for an animal to defend itself against T-Rex, it needed to have a unique defense strategy. Triceratops was a 10-ton tank with a massive protective shield and huge horns. Its only serious predator was T-Rex. We now know that T-Rex was quick on its feet. Today, the Dino Lab wants to know if speed and its massive jaws were enough to bring down Triceratops. Or if the Triceratops had a defense strategy previously unknown to paleontologists. Triceratops looks so much like a modern rhinoceros, it's tempting for scientists to compare the two. With regard to Triceratops, it had horns and it was a big, heavy brute. Uh, maybe it was a rhino, so therefore it had a whole rhino-like behavior, even though the bones don't suggest that. Triceratops fossils are extremely abundant. This was a highly successful dinosaur. It certainly shares one important rhino trademark, and it may be the secret of its success. It's the nose on its enormous face, which is actually a horn. The smaller snout horn and the two larger ones on its skull earned its name of Triceratops, meaning three horns. It's an astonishing animal from the perspective of its proportions. The overall animal might have been a, as much as 25 feet long, but a third of that was head. The, the frill in the back seems to match the back of the shoulders, and the whole animal seems to be basically a head with horns. And then the, the body posture is not optimized for a gallop, nothing like a rhino's type of locomotion. But at, if anything, it's designed for hunkering down and being able to maybe shift sideways and certainly turn very quickly in order to face its predators. The Triceratops did not have the speed to outrun other dinos. Instead, it stood its ground and faced them, using its massive horns and the frill like a sword and shield against both competitors and predators. New computer models take our understanding of its defensive strategy to the next level by uncovering exactly how this giant beast actually moved. We have here the important bones of the right forelimb of a or triceratops, but we can see already that there's a, an axis, a hinge axis, that this would have operated on. And it's sending the distal end, the elbow here, kind of curiously, it looks like the elbow is cutting across the path of travel. So we're already in a bit of a mystery. And Sophisticated modeling technology has been used to reconstruct the bone structure and simulate the movement of Triceratops, providing new insights into the secret of its defense mechanism. It's quite clear by zooming in and examining in detail, you can get a sense for the, that slanted axis that we were seeing that would be sending the forelimb uh, on a diagonal path. And then it gives a great deal of flexibility and more, more ability to move the body and roll the body. As it turns out, Triceratops was built very differently than we originally thought. At Dino Lab, our experiments and research confirm it behaved nothing like a rhino. It moved much more like a giant armored crab that could rapidly pivot and sidestep to defend itself. Since Triceratops would have been a dangerous and difficult prey to bring down, perhaps a huge winged dinosaur, which could barely get off the ground, would have made an easier meal, unless it knew how to escape quickly enough to the safety of the sky. When the huge flying pterosaurs landed on solid ground, predators took notice. It was especially risky because getting its body off the ground was a tremendous challenge. This is Dino Lab's Pterosaur Tamer. 
The team is studying the flight of this strange creature with a 30-foot wingspan that can glide across oceans like a modern albatross, but is as fragile as a bat. Pterosaurs love fish, so we are using one as bait to lure this flying reptile into the center of the wind tunnel we're using for this experiment. So people have been having so much problem trying to figure out how this animal could actually fly. And that's a very interesting question, which can be approached through all those calculations of aerodynamics and stuff. So it's so big, maybe it was not capable of taking off by itself. Maybe it needed some kind of help from the wind blowing at it, at it to take off. So just like the albatross living today, it's, they have to wait for the wind starts blowing or they have to run for a certain distance against the wind before they can take off. Peter and his team will try to find out how strong the wind needs to be for the pterosaur to get airborne. This will give us a better understanding of how easily it could avoid predators and assure its survival. As soon as the pterosaur is in the center of the wind tunnel, the experiment can begin. A naturally cautious animal, she's taking her time today. The pterosaur will often lie down if there is no danger present. The Dino Lab team has to work hard to coax her up on her feet and into the path of the wind machine. That huge animal is walking like this. And you can also guess that how vulnerable they were on land. Flight is the pterosaur's main defense and we are gonna find out how much assistance this winged dinosaur needs to get off the ground. Come on, baby, spread your wings. Now she's in the direct path of the wind machine. The fan speed is slowly increasing. Oh, yeah! Fly, baby, fly! Air rushing over her wings makes her begin to flap, which creates a lift. Pterosaur is wonderfully graceful in the sky, where she has no predators. And here's a reconstruction of flying pterosaur. And you can see that their wings, especially this Quetzalcoatlus, is very skinny and long. And it's good for gliding, but it's not the best design for quick turns or the, what we call maneuverability. So it was difficult for this animal to turn quickly. The wings of the pterosaur are covered with a thin membrane. It was long thought that the membrane was fragile and could tear easily. Recent discoveries show that the membrane is reinforced by a dense network of fibers which prevent tearing. Pterosaur's design was similar to a small plane, like a Cessna, a perfect balance of strength and surface area. The pterosaurs had very hollow bones, and that's really necessary because they had to keep their body light. And so it's unlikely that they had much of the breast muscles to flap their wings, and that's why it was probably difficult for them to take off the ground just by themselves, and they probably needed help from the wind. The pterosaur was an incredible flying machine. Our experiment, along with new skeletal measurements and computer flight simulation, has demonstrated that pterosaur needed a headwind of approximately 15 miles per hour to get airborne. This is the same as a hang glider with a human passenger.
the size of this flying reptile was only a disadvantage during its brief periods on land. But once they were airborne, they were the rulers of the sky. Coming up, this small carnivore called a trudon is considered the Einstein of all dinosaurs. But you might be surprised how it stacks up against modern animals. This has been a very busy and productive day at Dino Lab, and now the technicians are getting ready to test one of the most interesting small carnivores that was alive 75 million years ago. The Trudon was a relative of modern reptiles. It stood about six feet tall, the size of a modern kangaroo. This is the Einstein of dinosaurs. As a smaller carnivore, survival meant devising successful hunting strategies and then remembering them. He also needed the brain power to identify and avoid predators. <laughs> Carnivores have to work a lot harder to find food than their herbivore cousins because of the simple fact that trees, shrubs, and vegetation don't run away or fight back when you try to eat them. At Dino Lab, a special team is studying the Trudon's intelligence and comparing it to other dinosaurs, like the T-Rex. Leslie is the project leader, and she's ready to begin. She's testing if he can learn to return a ball when it's rolled to him. What's interesting with Trudon is that not only is it small, bipedal, and carnivorous, but it has a very exceptionally large brain on the inside of its head. If you look at the brain, the thinking part of the brain, the, the cerebral hemispheres, the big parts of the human brain, are enormous on Trudon. Relative to any other dinosaur out there, it's the most brainy in terms of uh, cerebral hemisphere volume to rest of brain volume than any other dinosaur we know, we know so far. Dinosaurs were far less intelligent than modern mammals. There are many ways to look at, at what the brain size um, can say and the brain shape. One method that came out relatively early in, in, in looking at brains and brain, brains of fossil animals was this idea of, of an encephalization quotient, or an EQ. The encephalization quotient is a simple way to measure an animal's relative intelligence. It looks at the ratio of body weight to brain weight. In humans, the ratio is about 1 to 40, which means that the weight of our brain is 1 40th of our total body weight. But what about dinosaurs? The large herbivores had tiny brains relative to their huge bodies. The ratio could be as low as 1 to 200 for sauropods. The small Trudon had a larger brain ratio than other carnivores. It needed it to both avoid predators and catch its prey. Good, all right. Good boy, good. Okay. It looks as if Leslie is starting to get some results. We can easily determine total body mass and brain mass for modern living animals but it's a lot harder to do with fossil species. We can come up with some estimates of what intelligence should be as a number value. Um, of course, humans are off the charts, but we're the ones designing the experiments. The Truodon, I would say, is not so different from a, an unintelligent bird, <laughs> something like a chicken. <laughs> I would, I, would, I would say w would be my best guess in terms of um, kinds of thought processes or capabilities of something like a Truodon. Even the intelligence of a dumb chicken was an advantage that gave Trudon an important edge in prehistoric times. Um, I don't feel 
too bad. Extrapolate. Brain sizes have always been a fascinating topic for paleontologists. Here, Hans and Ryosuke are examining the skeleton and in particular, the brain cavity of an Allosaurus, a smaller relative of the T-Rex. And for biological data, the, mm -hmm. if we look at the brain data, and so if you just look at the space here, um, we're looking at, let's say, about a third of a can of Coke. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if we cut that in half, mm -hmm. then we're looking at a sixth of a can of Coke. That would be the size of the brain mm -hmm. uh, powering this guy. Not terribly, terribly large. Not very much. We can see that that certain parts of the brain mm -hmm. have different impressions on mm -hmm. on that on that shape. So we can calculate how much, let's say, the cerebral hemispheres, like the mm -hmm. sort of thinking part of the brain, mm -hmm. um, occupies versus the rest of the brain. Mm -hmm. and, and if we do that, we can we, we come up with an estimate that that these guys' mm -hmm. brains were very similar, mm -hmm. at least in the, in those proportions to things like modern crocodiles mm -hmm. and lizard snakes and turtles, mm -hmm. so modern reptiles. Trudon had enough intelligence to grab an object, lift it up, and turn it around. But it only stayed interested if the object was edible, because feeding was its main occupation. There was no time in the prehistoric world for playing games. To survive, it had to stay focused on finding food and avoiding becoming someone else's meal. So, Leslie, any results? And based on the latest brain measurements, the Trudon has proven to be the smartest of all dinosaurs. The driver who delivered Dino Lab's new T-Rex has spent the entire afternoon observing different experiments. The plesiosaur has become the lab's mascot. There is no sea animal in the modern world that looks anything like the plesiosaur. Paleontologists hope this specimen in the dino lab will provide us with a better knowledge of how it swam, what it ate, and the advantage of its long, snake-like neck. Although an air-breathing creature, it was impossible for a plesiosaur to survive outside the water due to the weight of its massive 18-foot neck, which accounted for a third of its length. The plesiosaur lived in the ocean, but like a modern whale, it had to come to the surface for air. It's very difficult to make an analogy with living animals. We have to really look at the fossil and take a very good guess do, using computers and doing all the calculations to get at what they were doing. Scientists can now study what kind of a swimmer the plesiosaur was, given its unique structure. How does it use its two pairs of flippers and extra long neck to catch prey? They were not the fastest cruisers. So if they were to go after a prey, or the earth school prey, for a long time, maybe they didn't have that much of a chance, but they were very good at turning or the changing the orientation. And in addition, they had the neck that was at least to some extent flexible, which must have been very helpful in capturing the prey. While its long, unprotected neck would have made it extremely vulnerable on land, Plesiosaur was surprisingly agile underwater. All the dinosaurs in Dino Lab are very special, but there's no question that when it comes to making an entrance, there's nothing like seeing one of the largest dinosaurs to ever walk the face of the Earth. Dino Lab is especially thrilled to be able to study the most colossal creature that ever lived. We've named her Nelly. Its appetite was so extreme that it needed truckloads of food every day, and it ate non-stop during every waking moment. Yeah. 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 
Our technicians at Dino Lab have had Nellie under observation for some time. She is a 20-year-old female Apatosaurus. So here's Apatosaurus. Wow. Yeah, it's huge. It's rather impressive, isn't it? Up until now, paleontologists have studied fossils and bones to estimate the weight and size of dinosaurs like Apatosaurus. Must be very heavy. Can you imagine the amount of thick cartilage and muscles required to support the body mass of this huge animal? Yeah, especially when it's walking. The ground reaction force is coming up through this. There would have been uh -huh. quite a lot of compression load right here. Right. Closer articulation, but this... this it's particularly difficult to be certain just how the bones fit together because they were separated by a lot of cartilage. But we can calculate the general posture of the Apatosaurus. For example, the head was relatively low and hung way out in front, so it was vulnerable to attack. The skeleton was extremely heavy duty to carry its enormous weight. Maintaining the health of such a large body is critical. Our Dino Lab technicians check Nellie's weight regularly to monitor her development. Two important questions remain. How much did Apatosaurus need to eat every day to survive? And how heavy was it? It sounded like uh, something like 30 tons up to 35 tons. That's probably more reasonable than something like 50 tons, which agrees with probably many other people's opinion. And that's based on measurements of? That's Oh, that one, particular one's based on the measurement from the bones, like the humerus there, mm -hmm. or the femur there. Yeah. It'd be great if you could just simply have a living animal and put it oh, on Oh, yes, yeah, scales. yes. I so would, yeah. Settle it once Maybe for that's all. the first thing to do. Yeah. Right. But uh, we have to think about what kind of scale to put them on. Right? <laughs> have to be big yeah. enough. This is no ordinary scale. But then again, this is no ordinary lab. Nellie is full grown, and today she weighs just over 35 tons. According to our latest calculation, this is as heavy as 12 T Rexes or seven grown elephants. Nellie! But what else would you expect from an animal that was 80 feet long and almost three stories tall? How much food would it take to feed such a creature? Yes. Mama, yeah. And how did Apatosaurus find the time and energy to feed itself? So you'd have this 30 or 35 ton animal, huge gut on this thing. I've heard estimates of one or two tons of food going through the system. Imagine. Yeah, well, it wouldn't surprise me. It yeah. Apatosaurus were so huge that they had to eat non-stop, all day long, as cows do today. Ferns and big leaves of ancient conifers that grew at that time were the preferred food, and they were constantly searching for vegetation to eat. This might explain why Apatosaurus eggs were not found in a nest. When the herd was on the move to new feeding grounds, females simply dropped their eggs as they marched forward, driven by the need to eat. There was no time to stop and care for the young. Fortunately, the young could walk as soon as they hatched and immediately went looking for food. How much would an Apatosaurus eat compared to modern animals? Some fun estimates that we can think about, uh, especially concerning the really big dinosaurs like Apatosaurus, would be how much grazing area is required by animals of such size. 
Um, we have really good records now of, of grazing requirements for things like cattle, bison, sheep, um, even rhinos and elephants. So we, we, have, we have pretty good data now for how much, how much space or how many acres are required per individual of a given body size of some kind of mammal. Um, if we do those same estimates for something like a 20 to 25 ton Apatosaurus, it works out to be about 100 acres is required for grazing per year per individual. If we now look at Central Park, which is about 840 acres, we could fit in um, only about eight adult Apatosauruses into Central Park. But remember, 70 million years ago, there would have been many other herbivores feeding in the same location. Modern ranchers have to cut their, their numbers or estimates easily in half if they have just a couple or a small herd of, of deer on their property. So I think that if we were to realistically look at Central Park and ask the question, how many Apatosauruses could it sustain? I think that, that maybe one, if you include the rest of the, the, rest of the ecosystem. And since Apatosaurus were living in large herds, Central Park would have been devastated in a matter of days, as if millions of locusts had stripped it bare. Dinosaur evolution was a bit like a long, slow trek toward gigantism. For plant-eating dinosaurs, bulking up was an effective defense mechanism against carnivores. Gigantism as a defense mechanism had its downfall too, because it could reduce mobility and make Apatosaurus vulnerable to attack. <laughs> to eat and to survive, carnivores also began to get bigger and bigger. Moving towards gigantism allowed the dinosaurs to dominate life on Earth for 175 million years. An incredible accomplishment. Like any ecosystem where creatures rely on each other so much for survival, there is a delicate balance of life. Herbivores required so much food that even a minor environmental disturbance could spell disaster. massive asteroid struck Earth 65 million years ago, the giant dinosaurs didn't have a chance to survive this sudden and severe disruption of their ecosystem. It was the end to an extraordinary variety of life on our planet. Dino Lab is dedicated to studying dinosaurs as living creatures and discovering how they really lived. Good, good. The experts at Dino Lab have uncovered amazing answers to some of the mysteries of the past. And since our quest for knowledge is endless, we know we will uncover many more exciting new discoveries in the future.